environmental context. Uh, an area of particular interest for Mary is the Ediacaran fossils preserved in the Flinders Ranges of South Australia, where she has spent the last 20 years underneath an old Akubra um, researching these uh, fantastic fossil organisms. Um, and today she was speaking to us about the significance of widespread textural organic surfaces during the Ediacaran period. Uh, Mary received her PhD in geology from the University of Southern California, where she worked under David Botcher and is now a distinguished professor of geology at the University of California, Riverside. And with that, I'll open the floor for Mary to take it away. Great. Thanks, Phil. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, very nice to uh, see so many old friends and young friends um, on this uh, on this Zoom. So. Thanks for joining me, Alex. Always thanks for organizing this. This is um, it's a big deal to do this, and we all really, really appreciate it. Uh, so, I, you've all heard my title, um, and I, just before I go on, it's a lot of this work is done with uh, former and current students, Scott Evans, Lydia Tarhan, and Rachel Suprenen, and also my very long-term colleague um, Jim Galing. So as he did with many, many things, of course, Dolph Seilacher was way ahead of the curve in recognizing the significance of organic surfaces and the shift from sort of Precambrian backgrounds to Phanerozoic backgrounds. And uh, he also recognized the significance of these backgrounds for organisms living during the Ediacaran, essentially the Ediacara biota. And this is just an example of uh, triradial symmetry or organisms with triradial symmetry as Matt, as he described them as Matt uh, and crusters. So thinking about the ecological significance of these mats, um, Nora Nufke and many others um, have done a lot of work thinking about the sedimentological significance of microbial structures and uh, Nora uh, came up with, you know, miss is a, you know, sort of uh, phrase that we all know very well, microbial induced sedimentary structures. So today I'm going to look at both of these kinds of things, the sedimentological significance and sort of ecological significance of Ediacaran organic surfaces from South Australia. So specifically um, talking about Ediacara fossils of South Australia, where they are celebrated enough to get to warrant a domestic stamp series, terribly jealous. Um, and we are working west of the Flinders Ranges at Nilpena Station. And we acknowledge that this land lives within the uh, Adnamutna traditional lands. And this area, of course, has a classic uh, Ediacaran succession. It is um, right in the Flinders Ranges, is the type section of the Ediacaran period. Um, and that's my colleague, Jim Galing on the left, um, sitting just above the golden spike uh, as drilled into the rock. So the Ediacara member for um, those of you who think about Ediacaran fossils a lot is part of the White Sea assemblage. So three assemblages of Ediacara fauna, the Avalon, the White Sea, and the Nama. And the Ediac, remember, is, is one of the middle ones. And during this period, there is the advent of novel and diverse animal constructions, behaviors, and ecology. And we would also add to this um, the, the, a time when there are diverse um, and complex organic surfaces. So one of the interesting things, one of the things in terms of the preservation of these fossils is the majority of fossils um, are external molds on the upper surface of organisms, and they're preserved on the base of beds. So the fossils are almost entirely on the base of beds. So you have a scene such as that in the upper left, a storm comes and molds the top surface and uh, the fossils are on the base. So what we have done there, um, since the fossils are in fact on the base of beds, is we have been able to excavate a succession of beds, um, which is not really how paleontologists typically do things. Um, but there are a number of fortuitous aspects to the geology at, at Nilpena, as well as um, uh, things like organic mats as separators, which have allowed us 
to do this. And so we've been excavating these beds, the fossils are preserved in situ. And so we have these snapshots of the sea floor. Um, and this is a very laborious process um, and we don't use hammers and break up the rocks. We uh, map them, move them, flip them over and piece back the puzzles. And this is just a drone shot of a couple of our pits and we've now excavated about 40 beds. You can see people standing near some of the beds um, for scale. So the question is, what, what have we discovered with all of this? Um, and you know, to be honest, as I've told many other people, when we, Jim and I first started working at Nilpina, we thought we'd be there three to five years. Um, that was 20 years ago. Um, so uh, this has really been a very fruitful um, exercise in terms of um, excavating these beds. So obviously, you know, we're paleontologists, we found a lot of fossils. Um, we've described a whole host of new fossils, um, but the fossils aren't actually what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'm gonna talk about another aspect, but when we look at beds, instead of just looking at fossils, we look at whole beds. And so amongst the things we've found is a very high level of bed to bed heterogeneity. That means very different fossils from one bed to the next in terms of diversity and abundance, varying complex community ecology. Um, we also have components of all three assemblages, Nama, Avalon, and White Sea. But one of the more surprising things, to me anyway, was the this ubiquitous and complex textured organic services. We were prepared for ubiquitous. We assumed there would be mats over all of these, but the variability and complexity um, still surprises us as we excavate new beds. And so what we find, these are some examples of some of these organic surfaces. And we, Jim and I uh, coined the term textured organic surface in 2009 um, as distinct or as inclusive of MIS, microbially induced sedimentary structures because so many of our surfaces were not just microbes, were formed by multicellular complex organisms. Um, and things like down in the lower right, a surface we call baggy, where it's clearly much more complex. So we use the term textured organic surface to be inclusive of myths and other types of um, uh, surfaces. So the textured organic surfaces are varied within and between beds. Um, the variation can be due in part duration of time between episodes of disturbance, the composition of the mat, and the physical energy um, that is involved with, you know, what's the environment that, that the, um, of the mat. And these things matter a lot in terms of uh, the resulting ecology and ultimately the resulting sedimentology. So if you're sitting here thinking, poof, she's about to get in deep in the weeds with these textured organic surfaces, where we're going is to look at the impact on sedimentology and ecology and biology of these ecosystems. So they're just as a first cut, there are patchy ones um, like we call weave and micro pucker and the, this, uh, is about five centimeters across. And then those surfaces which cover beds, which is what I'm gonna talk mostly about today, that vary considerably in terms of composition, even though we don't know what's making it, as well as maturity. So one of the most surprising things um, as we excavated these beds was the number of beds. In fact, 10 out of 40 of these beds where the organic surface is formed by dead multicellular, or, well, definitely dead now, but by felled multicellular organisms. And they include in particular Phoenicia, which I'll talk about, Plexus, and as well as, as algae. So this is Phoenicia here. Um, this is a tubular organism. Uh, it is densely packed. And in this case, you can see individual tubes. Um, and this particular bed does not have did not serve as a substrate for other organisms, but sometimes it does. Where you have felled Phoenicia, such as here, this is a Dickinsonia and, and fossils occurring on 
these surfaces that were formerly organisms are not as well preserved as others, but at Dickinsonia shown here, these are two tribrachidium, which also occur on this bed. In fact, there's a pretty good diversity. And up in the upper left is the what Phoenicia is um, reconstruction of the organism itself. And if you're looking at the surface and thinking she's nuts, um, this doesn't look at all like the one before this or even the living things, um, it is because tubes in general have very variable um, taphonomy as I'll show in a second. But importantly here is we're able to tease apart essentially time averaging of two distinct communities a community of Phoenicia, which is felled in a storm, so knocked down in a storm, but not buried, and then organisms that later come in and live on that uh, Phoenicia surface. So in terms of Phoenicia, um, as a tube, as a hollow tube, uh, it has a variety of uh, taphomorphs, and this is work by my current PhD student, Rachel Soprenit, who's demonstrated very nicely all the variable um, or various taphomorphs of these um, hollow tubes and how it comes about that you get particular surfaces based on the nature of preservation. And one of the things about tubes is that they are preserved in a variety of different ways um, and not just Phoenicia, but many of the tubes that we have in general. Uh, let's see, my, ah, there we go. Um, so plexus, which is reconstructed here, is another um, organism that occurs in great abundance um, and forms surfaces. So here is a surface with a bunch of plexus. These are centimeter for scale. Um, you could look at that and say, eh, it looks like trace fossils. But when you look closely, these are very distinct organisms. Um, they lived in abundance, they died in abundance, and serve as surfaces for other things to come live on, such as this Dickinsonia. Um, or in another case, um, abundant Eoandromeda um, lives on plexus bed. So this is really sort of um, unexpected uh, complex, you know, uh, multicellular organisms which form these organic surfaces um, that are in fact bed separators um, between sandstone beds. But you know, obviously, most of the textured organic surfaces are not composed of recognizable organisms. Um, but you know, could be described as you know, gloop or slop or or whatever. Um, and so the question is, how do we get at at these, and what what do we do with these, and does it matter? Um, why why should we care about um, various and variable organic surfaces? Um, but before I sort of get to that, just to um, give you a sense of how variable this is, um, these three examples are from a single bed that's about 20 uh, square meters. Um, this scale bar is five centimeters. So you can see these are rather large um, and sort of this uh, much more small pattern. Um, and these quite linear features. So even within a single bed, you get quite variable um, uh, textured organic surfaces, and then between beds, um, even more so. Uh, and so we have, um, and, and even back in July, uh, walking around trying to come up with names, um, it's so variable, certain things are repeated, and we see them again and again. Uh, elephant skin is one everybody knows. Um, and uh, we have things, but we've come up with names like for these three, bubble and foam and hair and whatnot. And you start to accumulate like 20 different names, um, which is probably less useful than sort of looking at them um, as we show here, sort of classifying them as irregular or variable sized, um, uniform and linear in this case. Um, and using this, we can plot beds. This is a single bed. I didn't even put names on, so it wouldn't matter. Just sort of three beds and the combinations of these um, that they have. But really, one of the most critical things in terms of organic surfaces for both the ecology and sedimentology is the maturity of organic surfaces. Um, so for example, on the left, just to orient you, um, remember, we're looking at the base of beds. So this is the base of a bed. You can see a Dickinsonia. So this sandstone cast 
the surface below and cast both the Dickinsonia and the organic mat. Um, you can see some evidence of wrinkles, but they're largely muted. Um, you can see the mat is a little bit variable. It's quite mature, these kinds of structures. In contrast to this over here, where this is the base of a bed and you can still make out very, very clear um, ripples, this surface actually um, cast this. So this is up the top surface, this is the base of a bed and this bed would have been on top of that where you can see just looking at it that there would not have been extensive and mature organic surfaces because the ripples would never have been preserved that well. So one of the really interesting things is that these organic surfaces dictate the nature of the sedimentology um, and sedimentary packaging. And we're not the first to say this, of course, um, but we can um, have a few contributions that we find here. One of the very, very common um, aspects of the sedimentology at the, of the Ediac member is the presence of very thin millimeter scale, some of these submillimeter discontinuous beds or shims. And so here you see just a package of them, um, all sand, um, just, and I'm looking down, this is a plan view, so these are not flipped, where you see thin shims, which in fact we could peel away very easily. And thinking about these shims, if we take this section here, um, these over here is just looking at bed thickness. So the uh, y-axis is simply the bed number. So this would be like one, two, three, four, five, and so on. And the thickness of each one of these beds. So this, you can see H corresponds with H over here. I corresponds with I, uh, sorry, I corresponds with I and X corresponds with X. And what you see in between are a whole host of very, very thin beds that we call shims. And you would be excused if you looked at this and said, oh, there must be fine grains in between there. And the, yes, okay, I see you have some big thick sandstones and some thinner sandstones, but surely there are siltstones or mudstones or shales in there. But in fact, this package right here is entirely sand. Um, and there are different grain sizes from fine, medium, fine to medium and medium but it is in fact um, a pile of sands. And in between the thicker ones are these very, very thin shims, which are discrete beds that we can pull apart. If this were the Phanerozoic um, and you didn't have these organic surfaces in between operating, sort of filling the role of finer grains and operating as separators, in fact, this would be amalgamated and you might have you know, some thinner beds that are um, fine and some that are medium, but a base, basically it would be a very different appearance. And so here's this section again, we can think of it as um, time one, you get the development of a mat, in this case, a mat with some organisms on it, bed comes in, that gets developed, another bed comes in, that gets developed and so on. Um, and to show you that it is indeed sand on sand, here's a Dickens, whoops, sorry. A Dickinsonia with a counterpart. This is an upper surface. These are, you know, this is sand on sand um, between two of these between two of these beds. And so, one of the things in terms of maturity is the time that a bed is exposed before another bed comes in and covers it. Um, and so that will this here. This mat is far more mature, and you can see. Um, as illustrated here, the ripples have basically been, been muted out. So as part of these and, and this abundant uh, and ubiquitous organic surfaces is that it changes the nature of bed junctions. Um, palimpsest ripples are the norm. Um, and that again has been recognized by others. And here you can see them here uh, and here where you're basically instead of eroding or mobilizing the sand below, they are um, solidified by the mats and, uh, and then the sand coming in neither erodes it um, nor immobilizes it and just casts that upper surface. Uh, and so we also, it, with these um, palimpsest ripples, we don't have erosional boundaries. Um, in fact, in this entire succession, 
um, we do not have erosional bases. These bed one after another after another just casts the bed below it, which is um, very much not like uh, the Phanerozoic. So, you know, these, these uh, observations that we have, as I said, others have made a number of these, the very thin um, bed thickness in between this bed, in between H and I are actually six beds right in between here. Um, lack of amalgamation, lack of erosional bed junctions, palimpsest ripples. Um, and another aspect of this is adherence of shims. If there is not a lot, if there's not a well-developed mat, then the underlying bed um, will adhere to the overlying bed. And so what's interesting in, in all of this is that when we think about the sedimentary record, and I come from a department with Pete Sadler, so we think about incompleteness a lot in our department, you think about what the record is, are these actual depositional events? And so we know these instances where you have deposition or erosion and deposition, but what happens between beds is the unknown. How much happens between beds is the unknown. And this is one of the things that many sedimentologists and stratigraphers worry a lot about. How do we grapple with that? What's interesting about the record where you have mats and mats and communities and things are preserved in situ is that we actually have a record of what happens between these depositional events. And we can at least see the communities or the development of mats and get an idea of relative time between these depositional events. Um, and so just, you know, in, in terms of thinking about that, this is, um, Again, you're looking at the base of a bed. So this is something that has been flipped over. This is the base of a bed. This is a shim. It has cast the bed. Um, you can see the ripples somewhat muted, but still pretty much there, but you can see a pretty good developed organic surface, oops, that has cast the surface below. This is the overlying surface right here where you don't see a terribly well-developed um, Mat structure. Um, and in fact, this is uh, a close up of this before we got the full shim off. This shim was highly adhered because there was not a well developed mat. Um, I think we went through two audiobooks just getting this, um, this shim off. But here we have an idea of the sort of length of the level of maturity of the mat before deposition. Um, and then before this bed was deposited was not a lot of time. There was not a lot of time to develop a mat or even um, a community in that sense. So when we think about the fossil record or the record of these beds, there are a lot of things that control it, ecology, biology, reproduction, environment, biostratinomy. But you know, as I'm stressing, the duration of time between events um, is something that is really important, but also that we can get a handle in terms of relative relative time. So just to compare um, two beds, uh, this is uh, one bed, MM3. It's this bed right in here. You can even see those shims creeping out. It has things like Dickinsonia, Spragina, Trivercidium, Parvancarina, Rugocanides. When we look at it, um, it is Dickinsonia dominated. You can still see ripples, but they're somewhat muted. Um, and uh, common on top of uh, the mat, the organic surface is also this structure weave. And here is um, looking at body size, and I didn't quite get that bottom body size of um, Dickinsonia, that's millimeters on the base. And we can compare it to the bed I just showed you that um, we took the shim off of. And when you look at it, they're both Dickinsonia um, dominated. Uh, they have a lot of the same taxa, fewer taxa in this STCI. But you can also see this is body size of Dickinsonia, which is much smaller, um, as is the body size of other organisms and a far less developed mat. And so the ecological signals, um, not dissimilar diversity and abundance structure, but um, I had much less time before the disturbance that smothered, um, smothered the bed. 
so another aspect that's sort of looking at how we have a very um, anactualistic sedimentology and sedimentary packaging because of these organic surfaces, including the ones of that are dead organisms. It doesn't matter what the surface was, it still has this impact on the sedimentology and packaging. But of course, there is the other side of it, which is um, how these organic surfaces fit or are an integral aspect um, of the ecology of the Ediacara biota. And so one of the interesting things, we have the advent of mobility in the Ediacara amongst the Ediacara biota. The way that we know about that is because the organisms are disturbing the mat. And by disturbing the mat, they're disturbing the surface. And that is how we see burrows or in this case, Dickinsonia footprints and so on. So the evidence of mobility is because of direct interaction with the mats. Um, and so, for example, this is Helminthoid ignites, which is a fairly common, um, very common with us trace fossil. Um, this is a reconstruction of something that is much longer than the organism was, um, but it's grazing through the mat. Um, the burrows ha have directional, they have, um, uh, you can see direction in the burrows. And this organism actually went under some of these very thin shims. This here is the base of a bed. And so in order to form a negative on the base of the bed, the organism had to have been, um, you know, sort of making a little furrow underneath that thin shim. So these guys are abundant um, again, and they can crisscross and so on. Um, so as an aside to talking about mats, one of the things you, you see and, and um, previous workers and us would say, yep, the, this, these are uh, burrows made by, you know, well accepted as burrows made by a bilaterian, but we didn't know what it was. Um, and that's always been a little bit of a bug for us. Um, but then we found, excavated a bed which had associated these little as if tiny rice, rice grains um, on those on that bed. And so we decided to take a closer look. So this is Scott Evans looking very pensive and um, actually my son Ian um, looking troublesome uh, with the scanner and laser scanning all uh, hundreds of these tiny little things on this particular bed. And what we found was this organism here um, which we have reconstructed, um, shown here. I like to think it was purple, I'm not sure it was, but it, you can have fun with that, that we've named Acaria warriudia um, with very distinctive um, shape and size. And this guy would have been a grazer eating through the um, organic substrates. But other things move too. Dickinsonia, well known to um, well accepted to have moved. And this is, uh, here's a Dickinsonia and what we call a Dickinsonia footprint. Dickinsonia did not have footprints, um, but here is uh, from a paper that uh, Scott published uh, a couple of years ago um, with Dickinsonia sitting on the mat. As it leaves the mat and goes to another spot, it leaves a depression in the mat um, that is later with deposition filled in. And so that the, whoops, the footprint is a positive and the actual organism is a negative on the base of the bed, as you see here. So positive footprint. And this again is the base of a bed, um, negative Dickinsonia. And one of the interesting things that Scott's been able to do and, and sort of the prediction would be these guys are, are moving through a uh, surface covered with microbial mat that the minute they move from a spot that mat is going to grow in on top of the footprint, which makes the prediction that we should have a record of uh, larger footprints, better record of larger footprints than um, smaller footprints, uh, so that, sorry, than smaller uh, than body fossils. And so this is, and just pay attention, number of body fossils um, here. But when you look at footprints, we don't have that many footprints of small ones, but we have lots of footprints of um, larger Dickinsonia because it takes longer for the mat to grow in um, and cover those footprints. And there are other organisms, Yorgia, as well as um, uh, 
Kimberella, which uh, again shown here on the mat, which was a mat excavator and produced these structures here, um, excavating into the mat. And this has of course been interpreted by others as a stem group um, mollusk. So one of the things to think about is that the only time that we see evidence of mobility, the only time we see trace fossils is when the mat is really sort of excavated and moved. Remember this mat's gonna grow in quickly and you can, you know, it'll have variable consistency. So that not finding a trace fossil, for example, not finding a Spragina trace fossil, this is Spragina here, does not mean it didn't move. It only means that if it did move, it didn't um, impact the mat. So other organisms have different relationships with the mat, Obamas coronatus, which is uh, an organism we uh, fossil we described recently. Um, this is a three centimeter scale, uh, two centimeter scale. Sorry, and here is uh, this is this is the actual organism. This is a silly putty mold of the organism, and you can see this torus shape. You can also see the um, casting of the very thick uh, mat and mature mat that this was sitting in. And it's really hard to tell where the organism ends and where the mat begins. And while Rugo canides is a little bit better in terms of the edge, it's a blurred edge. And these organisms are one that, that were sessile and that as they're sitting there, they become essentially embedded in the mat and the mat grows up along the edges. But that's very different than some of our other ones. So here's Dickinsonia. We know it moved. You see very nice, beautiful mat. Look at these incredibly sharp edges. And this is not surprising. Dickinsonia moves. It would you know, plop down in a spot. And you would expect um, a very distinct boundary between the mat and the organism. But this is a really good relationship for organisms that we don't know terribly well. This is Atenborides, which we have described recently. And here you can see very, very sharp boundaries, which uh, lead us to interpret the fact that this guy was not sitting exactly like this or embedded in the mat and was not sessile. And I'll come back to that in a second, but just to point out that one of the things looping back to Spragina is that it has uh, very sharp, um, very sharp edges, which is um, important for us to pay attention to those kinds of relationships. But what about Atenborides? Um, again, very sharp edges. Here, these are, uh, this is a, a cast of this. And again, a cast and so on. It is, um, you know, you can see when you look at it, there's no direct symmetry. Um, it has these sort of longitudinal lines going up and down. Um, but, you know, you look at this and it's very clear that this is not what the organism looked like. So most Ediacaran fossils, even when compacted or molded from the top is really, you're getting a view of what they look like. In this case, we think that we are getting, uh, that this is a deflated organism. In fact, we reconstruct it to look something like this or like this, and that it is deflated on the sea floor as it gets buried. And the question is, what is the likely scenario? This the, just, yeah, we, the nickname for this before we gave it the name at varieties was raisin. It looks like a raisin. Um, and so we envision not to take the metaphor too far that it was grape-like in appearance and that upon burial deflated. And so this is um, a possible reconstruction with it sitting on the sea floor and one with it sort of just above the sea floor as a pelagic organism. And um, this is our preferred uh, reconstruction because we have no evidence that it was actually sitting on the sea floor. We have no attachments um, and uh, the edges are so very, very sharp. So it could have been rolling on the sea floor and buried, um, but we prefer a pelagic um, origin to this. And a lot of it is based on the nature, the relationship between the particular fossil uh, and the organic surface. So the, as we see the organic mats, um, they are integral, they are a food source, they are a potential um, source of oxygen for organisms that are living on the seafloor. They have a big impact on the um, sedimentology, 
but they also have an impact on preservation in terms of um, not even diagenesis, but biostratinomy. These are um, Aspidellus, which is a form genus, which represents the holdfast of fronds. And we again are looking at the base of a bed. So we're looking at this surface under here. And this organic mat structure that you see in here and surrounding uh, the Aspidella is actually formed by Phoenicia. And so we have a very um, tight association on a number of our beds. In fact, it's one of the few situations where we have repeated relationships between fossils, between Aspidella and Phoenicia. And what we see is that when Phoenicia is occurring with Aspidella, it protects the Aspidella and prevents it from being full, pulled out and uh, ends up results in beautiful preservation of Aspidella. When we do not have um, Phoenicia, when you have uh, fronds just associated with the seafloor and a storm comes through, and this is part of Lydia's master's work a number of years ago, what happens is the fronds are pulled out and you're left with, um, sorry, uh, simply, sorry about that, um, these structures, which we call mop, which are literally the pullout of these um, fronds. So in this case, the Phoenicia is sort of critical to the preservation of really good um, Aspidella. And when there is only a really thin um, mat, um, then these particular fossils are uprooted when a storm comes through. And it's one of the very few instances where we see um, fossils pulled out in a, in a large current where we see fossils um, or organisms pulled out during an event. So these mats are important at every, at every uh, level in terms of um, where we're going. Uh, with these, we're looking at levels of how do we evaluate maturity and does it really matter in terms of the various, you know, sort of putting names to these kinds of mats or is it simply looking at maturity um, and variability, but regardless uh, these organic surfaces were complex. We think they were consortiums of multiple taxa, um, uh, different kingdoms, phylum, they're eukaryotes, prokaryotes. There's certainly when you dig down in these mats and, and look at the surfaces, there are many different things that are um, components of the various mat communities. And as I said, from on a single bed, you see whole very different, uh, different mats. And finally, um, the organic surfaces dictated the sedimentology, um, which has really interesting potential for looking at relative timing um, and how we can evaluate sort of storms and um, yeah, how we can evaluate storms. So anyway, I will uh, leave it there and um, take any questions. And thanks very much for listening. Great, thanks a bunch, Mary. That was really great. Um, it looks like people are not wasting time to ask you questions, but I do want to mention something I forgot to say, and this is going to totally disrupt the flow, but I, I forgot to mention next week's talk. Um, and uh, so next week's talk by uh, Fabricio, Caxido is, is titled Birth and Consumption of Neoproterozoic and Possible Scenarios of Ediacaran Cambrian Ecosystems in the Western Gondwana. And I'm so sorry to disrupt the, the flow, but I did want to get everybody that information okay. before they went off. Okay, now we have a question for you from Nicholas Christy Blick. All right, Mary, that was great. So, so, so you, you've done this fantastic work at Nilpina with, with Jim and others. and. Um, I can't even believe the detail you've got there. It's just absolutely great. What I'm wondering, I mean, all, all that stuff is really shallow water. You're showing ripple surfaces all over the place. W what happens to those communities when you go off into somewhat deeper water? Is there, is there, is there a dependence on the water depth? Um, well, I think there's, there's two, there's a couple of aspects to that. Um, 
One is the, this particular face is, and, and you know this succession well, um, and in the, the, this particular area of the Flinders Ranges, we have this, um, you know, essentially what we would call sort of like the Spencer Gulf when I'm trying to describe it to people where you have, you know, you, you ha you're within wave base, but you're not surfing, um, you know, where you have, uh, it's not hugely high energy events. So I think part of this is that we're getting that this particular phases and within some other phases of this succession, we're getting spectacular preservation of these fossils. So we see a huge variety of communities within this particular facies. When we look at deeper water facies, um, and we have uh, at Nilpena, we actually have some that we would say we're, we're deeper water, we're um, sort of channel sands, incised valleys, which is something you know well from that area, where we are in deeper water. We get different communities. We don't get, um, some of them are saying, Dick and Tony doesn't care where it lived, for example. Um, we don't get the bed after bed after bed after bed after bed after bed of fossiliferous surface or organic mat surfaces. We get more amalgamation in the deeper water settings. Um, we, especially where we have storms coming through and it is not this more protected area. Uh, we see rip ups of microbial mat surfaces, um, which, you know, you see they literally mat clasps and things like that. So we do have a deeper water expression um, and even deeper still, we, depending on the fossil record is, is not as good, um, but generally, um, you know, we, it, preservation decreases going deeper as a very general thing. I'm not sure I'd ever put that in writing or ever want to be quoted, but that is what we, what we see, but there are still fossils in, in deeper water as we get, we never get really, really deep. This is not Avalon deep. Um, but we still have some deeper water facies. It's just that oscillation ripple facies is just that sweet spot. All right, thanks, Mary. But I so Paul Paul had typed us a question. He says, first, Reg Sprig, still a modernist, if he were alive today, would be thrilled. And then follows that up with, is there any correlation between bed thickness and community structure? Is there any secular change in community composition through the studied section? Um, so yes, but just to comment on Reg Sprig, Paul, um, I know his son Doug really well. Um, and I think where Reg would be really excited is that um, this is now a new national park, Nilpena Ediacra National Park, um, which is a great tribute to Reg and that we are in the process of, um, we already have a tentative listing for serial site for World Heritage, including Arcarula, which was of course Reg's um, preserve. And that has really old rocks that are part of the serial site. But I am, uh, you know, Reg Sprig is one of the greatest heroes and there's so many great Reg stories. So I'm glad, glad you brought him up. I, I would like to think he would, he would be thrilled. Um, so the interesting thing is that the, Thin shims do not preserve fossils, but you know, you're an organism sitting on the sea floor and you get a middle meter of sand, that's not gonna affect you, you're gonna shake it off. Um, and so that's the thinnest beds rarely preserve sort of regular old Ediacra fossils. So in that sense, it's the, it, the casting bed, the thicker the casting bed, or not the thicker, but once you get one to two centimeter beds, they will cast a full surface and the organisms can't essentially shake it off. So in that sense, um, the thick beds, thicker beds, centimeter scale, as opposed to millimeter scale are the ones we find fossils on and excavate. But of course, those, aren't, those don't represent the environments that the organisms were living on. Living, the organisms are living on whatever mat surface they're living on and it just depends on what's coming in on top of them that casts them. Um, so that's, you know, quite, quite fun. Um, in terms of secular change in community composition, um, yes. So right now um, we've uh, published an abstract um, on this, but we're in the process of naming a new member, the Nilpena member. 
um, which we think sits on top of the Ediacara member. So that what was the Ediacara member, we do think there is a, a break in there um, in the Flinders and at Nilpena. And Jim's done most of this work where we see, um, where we do think there is, um, you know, essentially a sequence boundary. Um, and it also corresponds with a erosional surface where we have a second member up above. And there are a couple of organisms, a couple of fossils that are unique to the Nilpena member, which we think is significant, but we are still uh, working through this. So there's a reason why you haven't seen it published. Um, but that's totally cool if we can actually demonstrate that. But through most of it, you don't. I mean, people are always like, they stand in a pit and you're explaining it and they're like, well, do you see evolution through here? And, and we, we don't. Um, and, and it's a not hugely thick succession, but it'll be very cool if we can really nail down this EDAC remember, which I think we will. So really interesting point. All right, thanks. Uh, we have our next question is from Juan Cui. Is in one of your slides, it seems that I saw some pseudomorphs of, of evaporites, gypsum maybe. Just want to confirm it with you. Have you found any clear evidence of evaporites on any fossiliferous beds? Uh, no, no, I'm not sure what that was, but no, no evidence of evaporites um, whatsoever. Um, so we don't, we don't have any evidence of exposure. We have looked far and wide um, for evidence of exposure um, as well. So um, yeah, I'm not, you know, it's in, in some sense we're, you know, we're looking at casts of surfaces. And so we're looking at the reverse of what they would have looked like. Um, we always carry silly putty because that gives us an idea of what it would have looked like in life. Um, and so that is, uh, uh, so, but no, we, no, no, nothing like that. Thank you. Yeah. But really good question. We think about that a lot, that kind of thing a lot. All right. Our next question is from Greg Ritalik. Are these mat class published? Uh, also, why do you, why do you think the shims are, why do you not think the shims are alien? Well, let, let, let me elaborate a little bit. Yeah. Um, the mat class. There. I'm, I'm, I, um, great talk, Mary. Um, I've been looking for Matt class for a long time and never seen one. It, it, did, did you actually publish that somewhere? Because I, Absolutely. I could... we, we published it in a paper that I'm quite sure because this happens for most of our papers that you wrote a comment and reply on. So this was, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I am, I am not going to, I'm not going to relitigate <laughs> a non-marine origin here, but- No, do you, do, you, this, do you remember which one it was? Yes, the microbial map paper. The Tarhan okay. et al. Paleos paper, we definitely- Paleos, okay. And, okay. And, and, and let me just say on the, the clasts, they not only, you know, we can see mat structures in these, in these clasts, um, clear mat structures. Is it in the same faces as the general no pen of flagstones? Uh, the, it a different, a different... the, the oscillation ripple faces, you mean? Well, the, the, what you've talked about today. Yes. Or is it in a different faces where you find these map fragments? It, it, it is. We get some in the oscillation ripple faces uh, formed uh, in, in uh, wave environment. And we get some uh, in our uh, sort of uh, planar laminated and rip up class faces which is uh, found not all over the place, but found where we have incised valleys um, going through, where we get similar fossils, so in uh, high energy events, but they are found in a number of faces. No, thanks for that. And um, my, sec my second question is, as, as you know, I did granulometry on um, the shims, and um, that suggested to me that they were probably aeolian, not um, aquatically deposited. Um, you don't like that granulometry? You know, as I said, I don't want to reliterate, re, re litigate the non marine. I, I don't. I mean, we find the same oscillation ripple marks with our shims. They're occurring in the same succession when they have fossils. They have the same fossils that we get in China, where it's clearly marine. You know, from multiple lines of evidence, um, they are, uh, you know, these are marine. Also, there isn't just shim thick bed, it is continuous, right? It is why the shims we think are really interesting mm -hmm. is that 
um, we can literally pull them apart because of an organic surface. So they would right. have been right. amalgamated where this, where if you take away the organic surface, these guys would be amalgamated. You can find, you know, a, a medium grain sand shim so that I can literally pull apart from another medium grain sh uh, shim with part and counterpart um, because of this organic surface. And so there, are, it's not, you know, you it would be, you know, quite spectacular special pleading to somehow say that they were and, and the others weren't. So it's what's most consistent. Well, as you know, I found identical structures with shims um, in the Mansfield sandstone, Pennsylvania and of Indiana, and in the Wasatch Formation, the Eocene of Wyoming. Um, these things are quite common actually in fluvial deposits where the shims are little aeolian splays little sands that are being blown by the wind. And then the main bed, which has most of the fossils on it, is a flood deposit. Right, so here's what I'd say. You can get thin beds in a lot of different environments. And so I'm not gonna argue with environments where it is fluvial. In this particular environment, you can also get very thin, very thin beds. And so just because a bed is thin doesn't dictate whether it's fluvial or marine. In this case, the associated sedimentary structures the sedimentary packaging and fossils all point to a marine uh, marine origin. But as you point out, it has to be non-actualistic. If it's and it and it absolutely, but it's a non-actual. But not according to my interpretation. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'll give up. Thanks so much for telling me about those mat class. I've been looking for them. Yeah. Okay, great. Our next question is from Anisha Ghosh. Why? Uh, why is why is there such variation in size of Dickinsonia? Does that correlate with uh, correlate with environmental differences? Um, so uh, Scott Evans has spent a lot of his time when he was at UCR looking at body size, and I think you know the body size distribution of Dickinsonia is you know quite similar to other organisms where you have lots of little ones and fewer and fewer big ones. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, it, it stands out because we got, we have, you know, Dickinsonia can go grow pretty large, but I don't think it's hugely um, unusual. And we have other organisms that are, of course, quite big, like some of our fronds or yorgia and whatnot. In terms of relating to environmental differences, um, that's something we're looking at. Um, we know on beds like um, the immature bed that I showed you earlier, those Dickinsonia are, are quite small. Uh, we have one of our uh, algal beds um, that we've uh, described with Shuhai. We think of as a nursery, it has really, really tiny Dickinsonia. So there are some uh, differences in terms of size and environments, but it is something we are thinking about as well as looking at sort of mat maturity um, and Dickinsonia, but they were mobile, so they can move in and out of environments. And as I mentioned, they are extremely common in the oscillation ripple faces, but they occur in every one of our fossiliferous faces. They were um, really like to go in a lot of different environments. So. All right, thanks. What, another question up in the chat from Eva Stoiken. Can you tell can you tell what the limiting component of the ecosystem was? If mat growth, for example, if mat growth was limited by the abundance of grazers or if grazers were limited by extent of mats or none of the above. So, yeah, so great, great question. Um, we are in this sweet spot, this Goldilocks zone where mat growth is where there were grazers, um, but that they clearly didn't, um, the, the amount of grazers clearly didn't get rid of all of the uh, mat, that the mat sort of outgrew the grazers, plenty of food, all you can eat buffet. Um, and so grazers were not limited by mats. Um, there definitely were huge amounts of mats. I suppose the minute a bed was um, deposited for a very short period of time, there wouldn't have been a mat, but basically grazers weren't limited by mats as far as we can tell. Um, I mean, so, and that mat growth was not limited by, by grazers. In other words, they didn't eat at all. Um, 
and they always had an abundant food source. So it's an interesting um, time in terms of the limiting component of the ecosystem. I would say the duration between events um, in terms of, and, and that's, you know, usually you think of a biological or a chemical or something uh, limiting factor or nutrients or whatever. But in this case, uh, you know, our, we, have, we can literally look at and have looked at, you know, sort of a scale of maturity of events plotting our, our 40 beds and that, um, you know, very mature mats tend to have higher diversity um, and uh, sort of even in many respects, larger organisms, particularly sessile ones, that isn't a big, isn't a big um, surprise. So um, some of these things are hard to get at, but the, the mat as a limiting factor, we, it does not seem to be an issue one way or another. Okay, there's, a, there's another question from an Alex that is not me. What do you think about Dickinsonia being, having been moved around by currents rather than by its own volition? If it's found in different environments, could it not have been planktonic or living in the water column? Um, so great, great question. Um, one of the most amazing things about Dickinsonia, and again, this is, uh, was part of uh, Scott's PhD is the fact that, um, and you have to imagine it's a soft-bodied organism, that it is one that if you rip it, you roll it, you transport it, you can still recognize it as Dickinsonia. So in certain faces, faces we do see transported Dickinsonia and we can recognize them. So that's one end of it. In terms, so I, we, I mean, there, there certainly are places where you can see that Dickinsonia has been transported. But on the actual beds where we see it, one of the things is, in terms of, and, and Scott's published this, in terms of the Dickinsonia footprints, you can see them actually in line the way that they occur next to each other with a slight overlap, but not a full overlap. They are not sort of randomly across a bed. We have places where you can see them sort of in a line. Um, and so that would be very hard. And, and on a bed where we see multiple Dickinsonia and multiple footprints, there is no direction. Um, in other words, it's not like they're all going south, so to speak. Um, and so that's one thing. We see them related. We have an anterior end of a Dickinsonia. And so we can see that it is moving in a particular direction, though on a single bed, they aren't all moving in the same direction, which would argue against currents. So there's a lot of different evidence that suggests that they were moving on their own um, vo vo volition. But, and, and part of the really cool thing is that we can see when they aren't, where they get caught up in a current and are um, transported, which is very cool. That makes sense. Thanks. Great talk. Thanks. Okay, Mary, Mary, I actually have sort of a maybe a two pronged question. Um, so firstly, uh, with respect to um, sort of maturity of a bed and uh, and I guess how the, the textured organic surface interacts with it, how does, I guess, the mode of, of uh, reproduction play into your thoughts, whether it's asexual, something like spores, or something that is sexual. How how does that change your interpretation of of a bed? Um, well, it's one of the things we look at. So Phoenicia, which covers beds, which uh, occurs in cohorts in sort of single um, size cohorts, densely densely packed. So. Um, we, we have inter we interpreted that over a decade ago as a result of sexual reproduction, much like um, Nidaria do today. And so that gives us this, um, you know, this very mature mat based on a single organism. Um, and so that's one way of looking at it. Uh, Obamas only occurs on mature mats and it occurs, uh, this is uh, Phil who introduced me, some of his work, um, you know, occurs in very discrete clusters and that so we, there are aspects of reproduction which we can pull out of, out of this. It is organism specific, um, but like the nursery bed that I talked about where we have um, a, a number of different uh, algae where you get really tiny guys, um, which is quite cool that it feels like not just Dickinsonia, but also Spragina and Parvancarina. 
um, that it feels like a nursery and at a time when um, we don't have any, you know, real predators uh, is, is quite interesting. So the, the, these are things we're working on, but they're organism or fossil species specific in terms of bed maturity and how we pull out reproduction. A lot of different ways of reproducing. Okay, I think, I think that's good for me, thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Paul comes back around to ask, is hurricane frequency at a spot a few decades per event in the, per event in the tropics uh, a useful concept? Um, absolutely, Paul. I think it's, and, and, and I just, I was telling when I first got on here, I'm on an island off the end of Long Island. We just had Henri come through, which you will have had if you're in, in Massachusetts. Um, and, you know, standing there as this, you know, then tropical storm goes through last weekend. I'm like, okay, well, what is this going to look like um, if I'm on the Ediacaran Sea floor? So I think, you know, where we're trying to get with this um, is to start looking at hurricane frequency in the tropics. What actually does our big stack of, can we constrain our big stack of non-amalgamated, but also non-erosive beds in terms of storms and storm frequency and things like that. So I think it's a really important concept and fun. It's fun to be able to think about these things, I think. Hey, well, we have another one from Greg. Um, it says, what do you think of my recent paper that Dickinsonia footprints were blown by wind on melting ice like modern glacier mice of mosses and lichen? Yeah, I don't, you don't, do you really want to know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I know already, but I'm wondering how you can refute it. Oh, I mean, I, you know, I think I, it's, I, I have, I mean, you know, I think it is there, we have so much data, Greg, we have so much footprints and, and, you know, I would just suggest going back and, and reading a lot of Scott's work and how we've gone through this. He has gone through this systematically to demonstrate that they weren't transported to demonstrate, you know, how it is within ecological time, not onto genetic time, and that you're getting the same shape. And I know that we dis disagree completely on on Dickinsonia and the origin of Dickinsonia. So I, you know, I I could be so, here all no, day. This, on this, this is interesting. Do you have evidence that they were not transported? What we have, I mean, no, we know in places, right? So we know, as I said before, we can we have one facies in which we have fossils transported. The Dickinsonia yes, are amongst yes. them. I, and so those are one. very clear transported Dickinsonia. Right. And they're they, in bits, yeah. Those no, are I mean, they're, they can be pieces this big. They're not necessarily in bits. They can be whole Dickinsonia that oh, are just sort okay. of twisted or, um, you know, uh, whatever. So they are uh, <laughs> just laughing at Paul's comment. <laughs> Me too. Um, <laughs> I am a certified <laughs> scuba diver, Paul, so... Um, yeah, me no, too. I, mean, yeah, I, 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 I think we have a date, guys. I think we I'm have Australian. a date. I'm Australian. I'm into surfing. And, yes, uh, and I, I, think, <laughs> I think that's it. But, you know. Okay, uh, that's good. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll argue till I'm blue in the face and you're blue in the face. And, the, and in, in the right. same paper, you, you might have noticed I also interpret uh, Kimberickness as um, needle ice. Yes, I have seen so, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, the, the, the scraping idea never worked for me because they're not furrowed like your burrows are. They don't seem to have levees or anything. Nothing. They're just, they're, they're needling through and some of them have a spiral uh, twinning. Well, I think, yeah, I, I, I think that you can, you can see all sorts of things if you're looking for them. For us, they are, you know, very similar to, you know, as it would look if you're scratching um, and not, it doesn't necessarily, they are certainly down in the sediment, we're also looking at the reverse, right? We're looking at the, the mold right, of filling right. in these. Um, whereas oh, it's with, pretty... the, with the burrows, we're actually looking at the furrow as it was made on the base of a bed, so. But you but, can actually see in places where it went in, when it went at, out of the top of the bed and out of the bottom of the bed. Um, that's really weird for a scratch to actually go into the top of the bed. Well, yeah. <laughs> The, 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 the Russian ones are best, and, and they also show them coming off divots. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't worked on the Russian ones, and I haven't seen right. them in person, so. Yeah, the, there's not that many in a South Australia, but um, anyway, um, let's keep talking. I hope you'll be at GSA and we can do more. <clears throat> yes, well, we'll see. Anyway. 
Oh, I'm going to go anyway. Yeah, I know. I know a lot of people are bailing out because of the. No, I'm. I'm. I'm hoping to see many of you at GSA, and you can hear about more of this from a number of my students who will be giving talks there. Thanks. So, yeah. Thanks, Mary. Yeah. All right. Well, we don't have any questions right left. So on that note, I think it's a good one to stop on too. So thank you so much, Mary. This has been. This is, it was a great talk and really fun to see the discussion and, and see you all interact and, and um, so yeah, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for being right. here and thank you for your participation. And um, we'll great, see you in the thanks. weeks to come. Nice, nice to see so many uh, friends on here. It's a, a nice thing, Alex, thanks for doing this. Yeah. Say hello Stay to Jim Gailey, one soon. of my favorite people. I, I will, Paul, <laughs> I definitely will. Right. Bye everyone. Thanks guys.